He was on the set. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Good evening. Now you can really hear me. Okay. Thank you for joining us this evening uh, for the first event in the Daniels Forest Series for 2012-13. Um, I want to thank all of you, especially for coming out on a slightly bleary night. I know there's a lot of things going on in Toronto all the time. I'm Richard Summer, the Dean and Professor of Architecture and Urbanism with the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design here at the University of Toronto and I will be both introducing and moderating tonight's discussion. This is the third year that we presented in the Forest Series. Some of you may have joined us last year for two of the 401 called Zoning Health, Architecture's Curative Nature, and then the second one, Jane Jacobs' Undone. Our goal with these events is to, prevent, is to present vigorous, engaging, and accessible discussions around issues pertaining to architecture, landscape, and urban design. For us, the Daniels Fora are an opportunity to bring together experts from different fields and perspectives, reach out to the broader, broader public within Toronto, and develop stronger relations between academics, experts, institutions, and communities here in the city. But we also aim, sometimes, to provoke serious debate around what are sometimes controversial issues. For example, knowing of course how revered and influential Jane Jacobs has been here in Toronto, last year we brought two scholars who have been critical of her thinking and her influence because we believe there's an orthodoxy surrounding the ideas of Jacobs, if not Jacobs herself, that was worth and is still worth reconsidering. So after the event, I got some, well, it was kind of like hate mail. Um, <laughs> it was really more like grumpy email more polite than that. Um, but I, I actually take these things as a good sign because it gets, it gets people thinking. And tonight's topic holds the possibility of being equally provocative. Now before I say a bit more about the subject of this evening's debate and introduce our speakers, I'd like to make a point of thanking our friends at Herman Miller for generously providing the furnishings and set design for tonight's discussion. Actually, each of the four, uh, they're eventually going to run up because each time we have different chairs and different furniture. Um, and uh, tonight we have a, a new set as well. And those are great chairs. I have one in my office. I highly recommend them, the white ones. Um, so uh, we appreciate the opportunity to showcase their, their work uh, and, uh, and we thank them for their continued support. So tonight we're going to explore risk, speculation, and the cycles of boom and bust that characterize our cities. This may seem an odd subject for a design school event, but there are perhaps no phenomena that play a more significant role in shaping our cities than money and finance. There is nothing new. Uh, oops, how do I go to the next slide? Here we go. There is nothing new uh, uh, in, 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 in this and what's been going on in Toronto and elsewhere internationally. Throughout history, the fortunes of cities, great and small, have been tied to whether they are able to gain access to resources and manage risk. In the Western tradition, church, state, and market forces have all at one time conspired to affect what gets built, how it gets built, and for whom. In the modern industrial city, this process has accelerated with private capital increasingly driving the building of cities within a global network of competition and investment. So Toronto, from its beginning, was a mercantile city, aggregated together through a series of land deals with an occasional civic and institutional flourish. Uh, and I'm gonna make a little, a, a little uh, detour here to tell you that by the way, uh, we're, uh, you'll find out in the next months, we're soon going to launch um, a project our faculty has to actually build our new faculty in the once Benina Circle, which is one of the major flourishes that is left in the city of Toronto. So uh, keep your eyes out for that. Now, so things may happen differently today than they did a century ago, or more than a century ago in this image, but if we wish to build a more imaginatively conceived, resilient places that are ecologically, socially, and economically sustainable, we will have to understand how financial actors, working with designers and planners, politicians, etc., how they all model risk 
and the role that financial structures play in building cities. I should also add that having architects better understand how both the market and many of their clients think is a goal for us too. And note that many, of, many prominent alumni from our faculty have actually gone on to be key players in the real estate and property development industry, including the namesake of our faculty, John H. Daniels. So these phenomena are not actually that foreign to us. Today, for better or worse, it is real estate developers that play a major role in what gets built and where in our cities. But real estate developers, in most cases, build projects with other people's money, using a highly speculative process. If we want to understand, for example, why there are so many condominiums under construction and planned for Toronto, we have to not only understand where the market demand is coming from, or where the people are coming from that want to own or rent apartments, but we have to ask, we, we have to understand how investors think. And condominiums, and by the way, we were discussing this before we came downstairs, most of the construction, even in Toronto, is still not in condominiums, but in other forms of, uh, uh, even in the housing market and other forms, but that's, this is a phenomenon we see. So most um, condominiums, because they're very visible in our mind, they may offer the largest and fastest return on investment in a given global market, and that may have something to do with why so many condos are being built here, uh, as well as at any local demand. But circumstances can certainly change, and there are people on the panel who have, uh, have navigated those changes, and investors may change their approach to risk, and they may start to look at other kinds of property-based assets, more than condominiums, at some point. Now, I don't want to fixate too much on the condo boom, but these kinds of projects that I see here, the, uh, the Frank Gehry design for, uh, for Burbage and, uh, and Associates, and the recent announcement of the casino-based uh, uh, project by Oxford Properties, developed um, by a team under uh, Foster Associates of London. These contract projects crystallize for many what may be the new normal uh, in Toronto, or at least the, the, the downtown of Toronto. Yet I would like to pose that at some point this evening, everyone should, on the panel and out in the audience should be challenged um, to think beyond the next single project um, in Toronto, to think beyond the city, even of a, of a project of this size, because some of these projects may actually have as much square foot feet in them as the entire downtown of Toronto did in the previous slide I showed you. But a modern city such as Toronto must have more than an aggregation of bold projects. In fact, what we are seeing is the intensification of downtown Toronto is what actually happens in, and has happened in history in any great city. Rome, Istanbul, London, Paris, New York. These great cities, uh, the places where we often find the most rich, uh, uh, find the most uh, rich experiences, uh, have built, been rebuilt and remade many times over. The bones, if you will, or the, or the infrastructural out, outlines may stay, but the meat on the bones, the buildings and the landscapes, actually change many times over. So, and you're seeing in this image on the top of Scarborough, uh, uh, what most of the built districts in Toronto look like. We even have densities in housing stock in the center of Toronto that still look like this. The challenge we face here as well as in many other places in the world, is how to better plan and design our new and large format cities in a more coordinated way. Toronto, like many other cities, has undergone and is still undergoing massive change, but really lacks any coordinated political, financial, and design approach to reinvent itself to meet the challenges and risks associated with everything from economic stagnation to climate change, and not to mention social inequity and isolation. So what I'm merely doing here is, is offering these comments as a, a, a query or a set of queries uh, to our speakers to help focus our thoughts in the discussion. They, they may have many other things around this topic that they want to address. And I'm extremely pleased to be able to present this uh, incredible group of speakers uh, who have joined us tonight to discuss these and other issues. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce in order all of the speakers, and then they're going to come up and give a, a short talk, and then we're going to sit down and uh, ha have a chat about the issues that come up. So I'm going to so I'm going to introduce all four, and then they're going to come up and uh, and and speak for 
you know, a few minutes. Let me start with Peter Clues. Peter is the principal architect of the firm Architects Alliance and has designed some of the most innovative residential buildings in North America. He's also designed a lot of other building types, but um, we're probably going to be concentrating a little bit on the, on the residential ones tonight. He has extensive experience in all aspects of the uh, uh, process of, 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 of designing and building both residential and other things, from planning and, uh, and, and economics to design and construction. Peter's innovative residential products have been published internationally and re received awards from the Ontario Association of Architects, Canadian Architects, and the City of Toronto. Peter is also a strong proponent of residential, academic, and mixed-use intensification, intensification as a tool for ensuring the vitality of the urban core. He was appointed to the Waterfront Toronto Design Review Panel in 2005 and speaks to professional, academic, and civic groups across Canada and the United States on topics related to design, density, and urban renewal. Okay, our next speaker, David D. Arthur, is managing partner of North American Real Estate Investments at Brookfield Asset Management. He's also the president and chief executive officer of the Brookfield Real Estate Opportunity Fund One and Two. I guess right. Uh, real estate opportunity funds investing in high yield office, industrial, and residential real estate opportunities in major markets in the United States and Canada. These funds have invested in over 20 million square feet of properties. And David is playing a leading role in over, I, now I have to get this number right, David. Is it 40 billion or 150 billion? Okay. It's, <laughs> well, we're talking billions. Um, uh, uh, billions and billions of real estate transactions at Brookfield. In addition, David is a director of Rouse Properties, Inc., um, actually a very renowned uh, um, uh, property developer, at least uh, that I know from the United States. Prior join, to joining the fund, he was president and chief executive officer at Brookfield Properties Limited. David was also founding chairman of Brookfield LePage Le, Le, Le Johnson Controls, a major Canadian facilities management company. He received his honors degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Waterloo and his master of science in urban land economics from the University of British Columbia. Our third speaker, Ira Gluskin, has served as the director of Gluskin and Chef, Gluskin Chef and Associates Inc., and as the company's president and chief investment officer from 1994, when he co-founded uh, Gluskin Chef and Associates with Gerald Chef, until 2009. He is currently the co-founder and uh, vice chairman of the company. Prior to co-founding Gluskin, Gluskin Chef, Ira worked in the investment industry for over 20 years, receiving a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of Toronto. He is a well-known industry commentator, and, he's, uh, and among other things, he's a member of the Mount Sinai Hospital Found, uh, Foundation Investment Committee, as well as part of its board of directors. He is also the former chair of the Investment Advisory Committee for the Jewish Foundation of Greater Toronto, and is currently a member of its investment committee. Uh, he, uh, other roles he's played is uh, as, as a member of the Toronto Symphony Foundation, and as a former chair of the University of Toronto Asset Management Corporation. Those assets probably add up to a lot as well. Um, our final speaker, Dr. Ron Dembo, is founder and CEO of Zero Footprint, a clean tech software and services company that makes environmental impact, measure, environmental impact measurable, visible, and manageable for businesses, governments, institutions, and individuals. Zero Footprint solutions mitigate environmental risk and drive cost reductions through behavioral change. Ron is also the founder and former CEO of Algorithmics Incorporated, growing that company from a startup to the world's largest enterprise risk management software company with offices in 15 countries. Algorithmics, now owned by IBM, can claim over 70% of the world's top, top uh, 100 banks as clients and consistently, is consistently recognized as one of Canada's 50 best managed companies. Prior to establishing Algorithmics, Ron had a distinguished tenure academic career at Yale University, where he was cross-appointed in computer science and operations research. And I'm sure some of you didn't realize that Yale, Yale had a department in, in operations research. So uh, let's get started with Peter Clues, um, who I think has some pictures. We have to switch around the, uh, the uh, you'll, you'll show us the IP. People, and uh, he was walking behind me and he said to people, Careful of clues up there, he's an agent of intensification. 
And uh, I think I'm more of a victim of intensification. I don't, uh, Toronto is undergoing probably the biggest transformation the city has seen since, I don't know, 100 years. It's, it's akin to what went on, I imagine, between the wars in New York in terms of a massive intensification, starting residentially and spreading outward. And I just want to give you a couple of really kind of salient facts to give you a sense of actually what's going on in this city. And it's, it's actually extraordinary. In 2005, the Places to Grow program or, or legislation was adopted by the provincial government. I'm very apolitical, but I would say this is the bravest political piece of legislation that any government in this country has ever enacted, and it's probably the greatest act of sustainability that any government in this country has ever enacted. It's a plan that forecasts and focuses growth from Toronto from 2005 for the next 26 years to 2031 and beyond. And depending upon, now some of these facts I'm going to show you are somewhat manufactured. Some of them, it depends on what source you go to, so please don't take notes and then accuse me of being inaccurate. But the plan essentially says over the next 26 to 30 years, there will be a growth rate in southern Ontario, the greater Golden Horseshoe, of around somewhere between 2.8 and 3.7 million people, depending upon what study you consult. And the notion is to concentrate that growth into a series of growth centers, Toronto being the principal one, Hamilton to a lesser extent, Ottawa, a few other growth centers, but a lot of it is a new curve in the city of Toronto. And the projection, again, depending upon who you believe, the city of Toronto's official plan suggests it's about 600,000 people, additional people coming into the city in the next 20 years. The Henson report that laid the groundwork for the Places to Grow program suggests closer to a million. It's a massive number of people. And uh, it, it's all about trying to focus and concentrate density to stop suburban sprawl. <clears throat> Another really interesting fact. In Toronto, or southern Ontario, principally in the GTA, there have been, in the last 15 years, 20 years, almost consistently, 40,000 housing starts a year. Most of that in um, 2000 was stick-built suburban stuff. Nothing that any of us were familiar with other than maybe driving up the 400 on the way to cottage country and seeing this, these houses sort of propagating out in farmer's fields. <clears throat> in the year 2000, 28% of those housing starts were multi-unit residential, primarily high-rise residential. Ten years later, which is five years into this plan, more or less, six years into this plan, that number, that, that statistic is completely inverted. Now 70%, more or less, of housing starts in the GTA are high-rise residential. There is no serviced land left within the area south of the Green Belt. Toronto and all cities in Ontario are really exist at the mercy and creations of the province. The province enacted the Greenbelt program. The cities in the major growth centers had to change their official plans to accept these intensification strategies, which has created a huge amount of angst within this city and other regions as to why are we even doing this madness. There are currently 328 development applications in the City of Toronto, represent more than 40,000 units working its way through, just development applications. The number of development applications in the South District, which is really what we think of as downtown Toronto, is 277. It had, the City Planning Staff and Urban Design Staff have Many developers in this room, if there are any, will know. I would say less than 15 people dealing with these applications in any kind of coherent, consistent manner. It's completely out of control. <clears throat> 
On top of that, there is no enforced zoning bylaw. There's an official plan that talks broadly about intensification. There is no implementing zoning bylaws, so every single development is going through a site-specific, very, very uh, difficult, full of angst process. With a broad engagement of the public and other stakeholders, and for better or worse, we're building a city this way. The official plan roughly designated that 70% of this density coming out of the official plan would be in the central core, 30% on arterials, such as Queen Street, Dundas Street, Bloor Street, what have you. The reality is, in the last five years, about 95% of it's occurred in central core, 5% on avenues. Why? Because it's extremely difficult, first of all, to assemble properties and do it in a, in a a sustainable way financially. Um, it is also created, and uh, if James Perrick is here from the city, he's just done a visioning study for the beaches in which the neighborhoods don't want this intensification. And so it's, it's a very, very rancorous debate. The number of residential units proposed over the next four years is greater than 100,000 people. And yet, in that same period of time, sorry, let me just go back to that. The number of units that were proposed through rezonings was 100,000 units. In that same period, 58,000 were delivered. This, I think, is interesting. The annual budget of the City of Toronto was $9.4 billion. That's larger than most provinces in this country. Of that, 7.4 billion goes towards infrastructure expansion and renewal. 16% of that is for transit. Transit, there has been, over the last six or seven years, a 50% increase in transit use. Various people have talked about the cost of congestion and what that, this is meaning in the city without a coherent transit, um, not a, a coherent transit plan, but an implementation. Revenue from residential property tax base is about 5.4 billion. What Toronto has done, which the city of New York has done, a lot of cities have done, have, have attempted to finance the cities through a commercial tax base. So if you remember the annual budget, 50% of the annual budget is coming from commercial taxes. Really, the, the commercial properties are subsidizing the residential properties. 240,000, rather $240 million is also coming from municipal land transfer tax, that's the sale of residential properties that was instituted by uh, David Miller under the new City of Toronto Act three or four years ago. Sixty million annually is coming from development charges from condominium projects. On an annual basis there's roughly a 45 million dollar contribution, an ongoing contribution to the revenue of the city through new condominium projects. That's every year. So in year one, 40 mil, 45 million in found revenue. Year two, 90 million. This is compounding every year. And yet, zero of that is going to the city budget. What I mean by that is they're taking a city budget of 9.4 billion. They're adding residential property tax increase in revenue and subsuming it back into that budget and basically reducing or stabilizing or reducing the increase in the existing pool of taxpayers. This is an opportunity that is really lost on the city. Out of these development applications, there's $21 million a year coming from what are called Section 37 benefits. These are if you increase, ask for an increase in density and a rezoning, certain financial benefits accrue back to the, to the uh, public sector. In last year alone, there were 14 million. This year, there's been 21 million. 
And now there's a backlog of $82 million in Section 37 unspent benefits. Now, to put this in perspective, we, our office just completed the revitalization of Bloor Street from Avenue Road to Church. That was a $35 million project in which we took five major city blocks, completely reconstructed the street from building face to building face with soil cells, granite paving. We reconstructed that street to last 100 years. This is, I think, an unprecedented city building, public ground project in the history of this city. You could take every year the additional revenue coming from all of these condominiums and put it into a major piece of public realm renewal and start to build a city rather than trying to kind of disperse it back amongst the existing taxpayer base. We could be spending the Section 37 money in a much more coherent and visible manner in a city that really has one of the worst public realm um, qualities, I would say, of any major city around the world. The average size of a residential unit in this city is 625 square feet. There is, for some reason, um, amongst the popular press, this belief that there is a bubble, that there are thousands upon thousands of units being built that are empty, and I can tell you they're absolutely not empty. There are a series of investors buying these units and renting them out. Essentially what we're doing is we're creating a new form of rental housing, a different form of tenure that every major city needs. I'm going to wrap it up. I'm almost done. Um, what this residential development is doing is driving commercial development. For the previous 25 years, there was less than a million square feet of Class A office space built in the city. There were various um, pundits telling us why from commercial tax base assessment and so forth and so forth. Whereas out in the suburbs there were 12 million square feet built in that same period of time. In the last five or six years there have been 5.8 million square feet either built or under development. What's happening is commercial development is following residential development. It is truly starting to intensify the city. I am going to wrap this up. We are, it's all, we're starting to invest in the public realm. There's over, the largest single infrastructure project ongoing in, this, in the country right now is the redevelopment of the Union Station Hub, which is over a billion dollars, which is the biggest kept secret in this city. Let's just wrap it up here. This is something near to my heart. <clears throat> the problem is, what kind of city are we creating? What kind of legacy architecturally setting aside culturally and urbanistically and socially, what kind of legacy are we leaving architecturally with the city with these projects? There's over 20 architectural practitioners in the city currently engaged in the housing market, and I won't tell you who they are, but there's less than five or six that are really good design practices. Thanks. <laughs> following an architect who all he talked about was numbers and money and things like that. And I'm supposed to be the guy who thinks about money all the time. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on uh, Brookfield um, and then uh, throw out one of the things that we think about and hopefully that background will, will help you understand a little bit about how we think. So uh, Brookfield is a company that is in the infrastructure business, and we call real estate infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure also means things like ports, uh, highways, toll roads, um, transmission lines. Uh, it also includes hydroelectric power, or a big uh, power generator, and uh, wind power. And we also have a private equity uh, business in addition to our property business. But in our property business, we think about real estate in four fundamental food groups. Uh, on the left is office, which is a big office towers like the ones like Brookfield Place, Bay Adelaide Center, that type of thing. We have a retail business, which is founded on General Growth, which is a large shopping center company in the U.S., um, and Rouse, which is also a, a public shopping center company in the U.S. Uh, and we think about intensification, like Peter talked about. Uh, because a lot of those are very valuable pieces of land that are way underutilized. Uh, we also have a for sale um, um, housing business, which is both in Brazil and in North America, and those are both 
high rise in Brazil and low rise horizontal housing in North America. And we have a multifamily apartment business where we own apartments and we're, we're in the industrial hotel space in an, in an emerging way. It's not a big uh, business for us. Um, we're in many locations uh, across the world. We use the word global really uh, loosely. That's our definition of global. Um, we also do everything from start to finish. We buy land, we develop, we lease, we construct, and uh, we manage. Uh, we've done a number of large transactions over the years, um, from uh, buying Olympia New York's assets in New York City 25 years ago, to buying general growth uh, in the last couple of years. So we're a consistent investor in real estate through different cycles. Um, we think about different uh, themes in real estate and how we can react to both micro, micro and macro issues in real estate and look for ways to create return in real estate, whether it's in an up cycle or down cycle, uh, and take advantage of, of things like distress in the markets as has, has happened over the last uh, few years. Now, some of our office projects uh, are up on the screen. Uh, uh, Australia, there's some of these we've developed, a lot of them we have actually bought. Retail projects like in Chicago, Water Tower Place, in, in Las Vegas, uh, and in Brazil. Uh, in our multifamily and industrial business, we we don't build high-rise, we build uh, more horizontal, anywhere up to about five stories, which is basically stick construction on a, on a concrete uh, podium. Uh, and industrial, we are um, really following the, the global trade and logistics business and invest in warehousing for distribution that relates to infrastructure and intermodal trade, whether it's, it's rail, air, air ports, or, uh, or road and truck distribution. Uh, we also have an opportunistic business, and these are some places which you've been to or would like to visit. One is uh, Atlantis in the Bahamas, which we were not a conscious owner of. We ended up lend lending mortgage money on, and times got tough, and we ended up owning the resort. Uh, so, But we don't get a discount at the resort, which has always <laughs> bothered me. Uh, we do at the Hard Rock in, in Las Vegas, which we also ended up in, in the same manner. Um, and these are some of our other projects. But one of the thoughts in, in just preparing for this, uh, given that it's a development and financing the city and, and how do we think about capital, I would advance the, the, the theory that why would we develop? Uh, because we're basically capital allocators. So we're looking to get a return on our capital, create lasting projects that we can get a, uh, a steady cash flow from, so in a slow growth market like North America, and this is a general comment, uh, we can buy existing assets for less than we can build them. So if we're not fans of creating some architectural monument, we would just as soon go and buy existing assets because we can buy them for less than the cost of replacement. Um, and if you buy, uh, build new assets in a development cycle in a city like Toronto, or San Francisco, or New York, and we've done it, uh, there's tremendous risk involved in that, whether it's zoning risk, whether it's construction risk, it's lease-up risk, it's financing risk, and so on. And in a slower growth market, our view is that capital often doesn't get adequately rewarded for taking that risk. And it's better off to buy existing inventory. And when you get into cities like Toronto or New York, and you own inventory, you own assets, and there are barriers to entry, as such as created in Toronto by the development cycle and the comment that Peter made about you know, how difficult it is to get approvals and how short-staffed the city is. All that does is make your existing assets in the city more valuable uh, because it's harder to find building sites, it's harder to get uh, things developed through to uh, completion and so on. So we have been a very timid developer and a fairly um, aggressive acquirer of existing assets for that reason. Like I, my job is managing money for rich people. It's an important social job. Um, and, but it's in securities. It's in uh, stocks and bonds and hedge funds, stuff like that. Um, not real estate. Many of our clients are 
from real estate, as you might expect. And prior to forming Glasgow Chef 30 years ago, I, I did have a bit of a real estate background. I followed public real estate securities for a long period of time. And even before that, before most of you were born, I worked for a life insurance company and I helped them analyze credits for the mortgage department. So I've been following, you know, it was sort of a hobby, following real estate. Like, um, I could give you the other side of what David says if I chose, but uh, generally I do believe it's a tremendous company. They have 300 public companies, the most successful complex company in the world. It's a huge success, but they don't do condos. This is the most amazing thing about the Toronto, and I might say Vancouver, condo business. It is absolutely a massive, massive business. But there are no, and I say no, public companies operating condos. What that means is that there is no real tangible information. It's really all hearsay. No one really knows anything. The, real, the only people who really know what is going on in condos are condo developers. Unfortunately, they lie. Um, <laughs> like in the world, you know, we're in a sleazy world. Uh, you watch television advertising, it's not always sincere. Um, the worst advertising, the most hype, is in the condo business. Like, there is nothing like it. Uh, you know, our newspapers, which are normally fairly objective, you know, over the years they've sold their soul to condo developers. And me, I like condo developers. Like, I play golf with them. Like I say, uh, they're big clients of ours. Some of them are personal friends. But they really have swallowed the Kool-Aids. They really believe a lot of what they tell you. And unfortunately, it really, that really isn't true. I think uh, you know, we were talking before about where the controversy is in, in this condo business. And you know, there's probably a bit of a controversy. The condo developers think it's going to go on forever. And there's all sorts of people think you know, it's the world's greatest bubble. And like I say, there's no hard reality because there's no official numbers. But take my word for it, uh, it slowed down about a year ago. Now again, you can't expect the condo developers to call up the Toronto Star and say, uh, they think it ended. Uh, <laughs> so, and there are people who don't believe in it. But they never believed in it. They never believed in this boom in Toronto. So there are naysayers, and they're always negative, and no one really pays any attention to them. So it's, there are people who have produced studies for the condo developers, but uh, I don't know, I, they leave me cold. But here's the harsh reality as far as I can tell. Remember, uh, these boys and girls never put up any of their own money. They put up you know, 20, 25%, unless they put up a lot less, they get a lot of partners, uh, and try not to use too much of their own money. And so it's borrowed money. So where's the big bulk of it come from? Well, it comes from, you know, really romantic, dramatic people called the Royal Bank, the Bank of Nova Scotia, the PEV Bank, Bank of Montreal, National Bank, and people run these banks, they're not geniuses, but they read the paper, and. They read that there might be a condo slowdown, and they ask their divisional people if there might be a condo slowdown. And anyways, my friend John Love, he talks about, he calls it the Monday morning meeting. They get together and say, let's not finance any more new condos. You know, we've got a few really big developers who pay huge fees, but the rest of them will wait. They're not going anywhere, just being deferred. And it just automatically slows down. And uh, there's a lot of grandiose announcements. You know, again, I like David Mervish. 
is as good a Canadian citizen uh, as anybody else. The likelihood of three 80-story towers being built in a decade is zero. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and, but that's a someone's supply classification. And it just will slow down. I mean, there's just a basic rule. The banks don't want to lose that much money. And they insist on pre-sales. And over the years, they were incompetent at this years ago, but over the period of years, they've learned that the developer's cousins are not real people. <laughs> I'll stop for now. Um, one of the biggest risks that we see is global warming, which we've all heard about. But that, that has a tremendous impact on what we actually do with our city, and how we renovate it, and how we build, and what's going to happen when we do get hit. So for example, um, within about 15 years, Toronto will experience, most likely, three times the number of hot days that we experienced you know, at the beginning of the century, which was about 20 days a year. So it's going to be up to 60. So uh, start investing in the air conditioning. Um, cities are where carbon is produced and where um, greenhouse gases are originated. But a very large proportion of all of that comes from buildings. And if we were to look at cities, this is London, taken from Tower Bridge at night with an infrared camera. And you ask, where does that heat leak out, or where does the cool leak from? It's from the walls of those buildings. About 90% of all of those buildings will still be here in 2050. <coughs> that means that we're going to have to do something about existing buildings, and it's not all about new condos. The new condos we're building are going to be a legacy that we're going to have to deal with sometime in the future, because they're going to look like this. Um, so what's the problem? The problem is that the skins of these buildings are just inadequate. And if we're going to do anything to avoid global warming, we're going to have to retrofit our cities. So we run a competition together with uh, Daniels and uh, soon to be a number of other universities like Princeton, Berkeley and so on. And I'm going to show you what, what cities could look like if we retrofitted them. Not only more beautiful, but much, much more efficient. So here's an old warehouse in San Francisco, it was the winner of our 2010 prize, and here's what it could look like when it's retrofitted, reskinned. It's just a new skin over that building, and uh, it's about 70% more efficient and a lot more beautiful. This is Paris, it's the first concrete building in Paris, and uh, instead of tearing it down, it was reskinned and made more efficient, and is now an icon on the same. This is a building, a gorgeous building in Belfast. And we've seen lots of buildings like this in Eastern Europe and in Eastern Toronto. <laughs> and uh, it could look like this after it's reskinned. And it's now, this one is about 60% more efficient and uh, clearly a lot more pleasant. Um, this is Sydney, and it's the ugliest building in Sydney voted by the uh, Sydney population. And this is a concept of what that building could look like if it was reskinned. This, this skin is one that's actually solar. But it shows you that just by taking a single building and retrofitting it in a city, you can change the entire view of that city. This is Lyon, and this was uh, one of the finest in our competition. And here's a, a sort of reskinning is and sort of rebuilding of that, which has, you know, completely changed the landscape of that city. Here is our famous uh, local building, but this is, this is actually a really good example of what could happen. And that is, you can take a building like this, which was really in need of a retrofit, and actually retrofit it while people are still living and working in it, and make it much more beautiful. And in this case, I wish, uh, I wish it would have been more energy efficient. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. Um, <laughs> 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 um, 
What was beautiful about this building was that the architects developed a system for retrofitting. And that's one of the most important things. We are going to have to not only build monolithic three-story or three, three tower events in Toronto, but we're going to have to retrofit entire areas of Toronto. There are 2,000 multi-residential, family, multi-family residential buildings in Toronto that ring the city. About a thousand of them are in desperate need of retrofitting, and they actually um, contribute 40% of, of our particulate matter or something like that, something of that order. If we were just to retrofit those thousand buildings, make them 70% more efficient, the savings in health costs from asthma trips to the emergency rooms in the next 20 years would be $10 billion. You could retrofit the city on health cost savings. Here's a nice one. This is a very pretty um, building on the campus in, in Aachen. And this is what it looks like when it's retrofitted. And uh, it's now actually turned from being the oldest building in the city to actually the defocal point of Aachen. So, I think we're faced with an interesting problem that keeps on getting swept under the rug. How do we retrofit Toronto so that it's more beautiful, so it's more energy efficient, emits less carbon, and actually is a much nicer place to be? Here is what we can do with houses. This is LA. Unfortunately, they've got a good climate. This is a reskinning of an LA house in Venice. Uh, quite a bit more beautiful, and it, it won the prize. So I'm going to leave it at that, and uh, uh, I'd like you to think that it's not just about the new buildings and the new condos, but it's what we do with the old buildings. Big commercial properties are publicly owned. The really big properties in Canada are owned by big pension funds, but they, they have a pretty good disclosure. And then there are public companies like Brookfield, and rates that own a lot of commercial property. So there's a lot of information. But you don't need the government. Uh, like I was just walking by Richmond Adelaide Center the other day and I, I see that they're closing down and doing a renovation. If you have prosperity and you have high rents, then there's just such a difference between what these old properties are generating in old rents and what they could be worth they would get anywhere near new rents, that the free enterprise system works. And it works really well today because interest rates are really low. Uh, see, the most amazing phenomenon of commercial real estate is so something like the Toronto Dominion Center. I think it was the best location in the best city. Uh, they got lower rents than they did 25 years ago. But the reason still around is because interest rates are a third of what they were 25 years ago. So that just changes the dynamics. But we don't need government. That, we need government for, I would say, uh, you know, really politically sensitive areas, places that are actually owned by government and they're going to be developed. But for the existing free enterprise structure, it'll take care of itself. But that free enterprise structure operates in a framework uh, of public infrastructure. So you take uh, Lower Manhattan in 9-11 and what happened then and, and how destroyed that public infrastructure got, whether it was roads or <coughs> connections or whatever. And now with public infrastructure, it's providing a framework for rejuvenation of lower downtown by the new rail system, the new memorial, all the highway and other infrastructure. That's allowed the commercial private sector to come in and build commercial space. So in some cases, you need that push from the public sector. You know, in the year 1820, when I first started to go to New York, <laughs> there, was, <laughs> there was LaGuardia, uh, there was Kennedy. Uh, the same bridge, they haven't built a new bridge. Uh, they haven't built a new tunnel. They certainly haven't built a new highway. They've taken some down. And they take some down. And it was anarchy 30 years ago. I was just there yesterday. Um, still anarchy, but somehow it's functioning. Uh, nowadays, you know, it's a little bit unusual. Uh, you know, 
there's not that many cities experience uh, 9 11. Like there's, this is a very sensitive, special topic. But I, I, I'm not sure that's true about here because you're old but not that old. Uh, and uh, Robert Moses actually built major infrastructure uh, in the middle of the 20th century. That, uh, that yeah, that was the 1920s, it, 30s, 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 30s through, through, through to the early 60s. 60s. But people demonized him for many years. But the fact is that the, the New York's functioning as a metropolis does depend on the large scale infrastructure that was put into place uh, before the 1960s. Yeah, we, 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 had, we had Fred Garner <coughs> Expressway. Um, yeah. He was our tyrant, the head robber Moses. I love the line that uh, Fred, Gar uh, Fred Gardner gave when it was all done. Someone said to him, Could you do anything differently? And I said, Not a thing, it's perfect. <laughs> so, Peter. You uh, ended your talk in telling us that uh, the city is uh, able to collect a lot of a, a, a lot of money uh, from all of the real estate and actually potentially future investment in the city. Absolutely, uh, William Thorsell said said to me once, "This is a city that's obsessed with its plumbing." And that's why I gave those figures. I was trying to be more like you, <laughs> but it's extraordinary, like. 70% of the money that's raised in the city is towards infrastructure renewal. But it's about plumbing. Let's not kid ourselves. It's not about new parks. It's not about public realm improvements. And I, I, I happened on this uh, statistic one day with Adam Vaughn, Councilor Adam Vaughn. And he said, well, you know, Peter, what we're finding out is that these condos that have been built are actually a tax and a drain on the finances of the city because they're causing infrastructure renewal faster than perhaps we would ordinarily and also infrastructure expansion. I said, that's ridiculous. It's just throwing off money every year. He said, I don't understand it, but this is what I'm told. So I started digging into that. And that's what I, I discovered, this extraordinary thing in the, the finance business types, this idea of comp, it's like reverse compound interest, which is becoming in every year more and more, and I think there's an extraordinary opportunity there. There's not enough public discourse about the public realm in the city. There's a lot of angst about the quality of the condos, absolutely, and I think the fair game in, in, in the, the questionable architectural integrity of a lot of these buildings, but also the homogeneity typologically of them. There's just sort of one type fits all, and we're just reading right, out yeah. like uh, sausages. But there's also an opportunity here to seize the day and turn the, the public realm in the city into uh, an amazing place, you know, through, through, through this, this financing. And I, I grew up in Montreal, and I was, uh, I hated Toronto, you know. Toronto was the end place. Toronto was the LCBO with the Venetian blinds that closed at 7 o'clock. And we used to snicker and snipe about Toronto all the time. And I go back to Montreal. I was there this summer visiting friends, and they still snipe by Toronto. It's like they're still stuck in this idea that you know, that's Toronto 30 years ago. Toronto's actually becoming an interesting place with all these condos. So let's trip away all the crap about another glass building and timber weeds on the CBC and the quality of them. Yeah, 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 that's all true. But it is changing the, the, the social fabric and cultural fabric, business fabric the city in terms of vitality, and that is an amazing thing. And it's now about harnessing that and saying, well, how can we do this even better? How can we use this to build a great city? And I think that that's the big opportunity and the big risk. So you've made an equation between the uh, tax and revenue the city can bring in from all this intensification and what they're doing. And Ron, I know in our discussions uh, around the reskidding, uh, our faculty's involvement in the tower renewal project, which is very difficult to get off the ground, mostly because of the finance uh, portion of it, uh, because all those towers are owned by separate owners and they have very little incentive or, or funding to, to uh, remake them from an uh, energy performance point of view. Um, what is it about the, the structure of uh, residential real estate and condominiums that works against the kind of things that you and you were to save and save 70% of that for seven hundred thousand dollars a year, that's kind of a lot of money to fund retrofitting. And 
you can actually show quite easily that you can retrofit a building like that at zero cost to the owner. In fact, maybe reducing future costs and future risk, like the, the risk of um, future, future risks around the operation of the building or maintenance of the building. Um, you can show that you can do that. In, in many cases, you can, in, in New York they've shown 10,000 of the buildings of the worst buildings that could be retrofit without any, anything, any cost to the owner. Because the actual benefits are sufficient to pay for it. So you say, why wouldn't an owner, uh, it's true, it's fractured ownership here, but why wouldn't an owner offer the chance to retrofit the building, make it more beautiful and more efficient, take that, and uh, even at zero cost. And it actually boils down to risk at some, at, at some very basic level. It ain't broke, you know, they have a good life and they make a lot of money on those buildings and don't really have to retrofit them apart from emergency sort of patching. Um, and so why change it? Even though you could show on paper that they'd be better off, they'd earn a better asset at the end of the day. Uh, so it's, 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 the problem there is really there, isn't enough, there aren't enough examples of having done this that people can point to. Now, people don't want to be the first of the building retrofit at zero cost. So and then that's one of the problems. The other problem is, is that it's a structural problem. If I'm in another building like that, and I'm going to pay for my retrofit out of the benefits, you, the financial institution that's doing this for the building, will have to accept my credit, which is not very good. There's so many ways that that can be overcome. And it's starting to happen. For the first time, it's really starting to happen. The, the essential problem is taking the, the risk, of, taking the cost of retrofit off the balance sheet of the owner. So if you can do this off balance sheet, then you can do the financing. You can keep the owner's credit rating as it was before and still get the retrofit. And that's what is happening. So for example, instead of me, if I were to pay 100 bucks a month more in municipal taxes on my house, and you can come to me and say, I'll retrofit this Victorian house, it'll be 70 percent more efficient, not cost to you, I'll do it. But if you say here, you know, for another four hundred thousand dollars you can retrofit your house and it'll be 70 percent more efficient, and you're gonna owe four hundred thousand more to the bank and reduce your credit, you want to do it. So what has happened is in certain states and in certain jurisdictions, uh, that has that has been allowed that you can increase municipal taxes on a building as a means of funding retrofits. And that's great because what happens is, even though Ron Denver might not have great credit, you know, I don't give up on my house unless I abandon it. So the, the credit rating on tax on a house is very high. And so I think it will happen, but it does require government, it does require structural changes in how we, we view funding. Uh, so I, I'm very really optimistic that it could be changed, and it will be, and that we'll see a lot happening. I just wanted to add a comment. And so you have commercial assessments in the city, which are very high on a relative basis to other comparable cities. And commercial leaving the city. So. And commercial moving out as, well. as a result. But the growth in the assessment base is residential. And the residential assessment base is low on a relative basis, and because it's political and it's votes, they don't do it. So with all these new condos coming into the city, all these new households being created, they're not taxing them at a, at a level that is appropriate for the services and the infrastructure that they're getting and why. This is the most misunderstood concept in Toronto, I would say. I mean, if you ask any residential property owner, are they paying too much property tax, they would say yes. They wouldn't believe you. I mean, New York has a similar problem, is it not? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, all I can say is to go to a lot of real estate panels, and I don't know, seven or eight years ago, was, downtown was dead, and suburbia was alive, and it was because our taxes was too high, and the suburbia had this huge advantage, they had these lower land costs, they didn't have the high taxes, and it was clear that the city was going to be empty debt. So somehow, they, I don't know how, but uh, renters will absorb it in the end. Right, so the workforce has changed.
changed in that seven or eight years to, to be a younger workforce that wants to live downtown, wants access to the amenities and so on. So we're, we're going to end up paying for it at some point because we're building these and we're accommodating that. Companies want to locate where they can get knowledge of workers and so on, which is downtown. They don't want to live out of 905. And, but the infrastructure is not keeping up with it. The services are keeping up with it. So sooner or later, there's a gap. Well, what the infrastructure of the century is the internet. It's, it's fiber optic cable. It's the ability to communicate. If you go to Amsterdam today, every single house has very, very high speed internet. Something I can't even buy downtown here. Um, if you go to Barcelona, they're planning Barcelona as a city of what they call slow neighborhoods, I guess in slow food, that are connected by very high speed infrastructure and they mean electrical electronic. Yeah, in Amsterdam, in many areas of Holland, so you can walk into areas where you, without commuting you can work in your office which is across the country. And so the vision of what a life will be like in a modern city, competitive city, is something we're not even talking about here. What we should be building, the kind of infrastructure we should be funding and building, is electronic communication infrastructure. And that might help the 905 commute and, the, and, and so on. I mean, but by the way, you're talking about cities that have already made great investments in their, in their physical infrastructure over the last 30 years of Barcelona. So they, they, they have the advantage, actually, of, 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 of beautiful streets, which can now be well wired. Yeah, it, it, but it's not it's either or. It, it's not either or. We, right. we will not compete with those cities if we don't have that kind of infrastructure. You know, um, a lot of people talk about um, data being the oil of the 21st century. And I really believe that. So it's, you're going to see a huge amount of stuff happening with data. It's just data flowing back and forth. But the amount of data, the amount of data that's coming out of our cities being measured by sensors and so on is enormous. And that's going to generate a huge amount of, uh, of the economy. Who's financing, for example, the infrastructure, the big infrastructure in Barcelona versus who finances it in, say, in Barcelona? It's, it's the city. Because the city has a vision for Barcelona. And they are, their vision is that the city of the future is going to need heavy infrastructure and internet. Or in Toronto here it's financed by the private telecommunications companies, right, or public companies. Yeah, but why should it be treated any differently than the private No, I agree. Market? I agree. You know, one of the, slightly off topic, but one of the things that drives me crazy about the public realm in Toronto is that the utilities have unfettered access to the streets and sidewalks so that they can actually, at any one time, just show up in front of your house and dig a hole. Yeah, they do. And then what they do is it they... It looks like a bomb. <clears throat> yeah. And then what they do is they put an asphalt patch <laughs> and the city takes a deposit from them to renew that piece of sidewalk or whatever sometime down the road. And the problem is they never do. They, they do it when that street or that sidewalk is on some kind of scheduled upgrade 10 years away or 15 years away. But the, the point here is that utilities shouldn't have that kind of control. There needs to be a better kind of uh, organization of this. When we were doing Bloor Street, uh, we tried to come up with, only time will tell, designing a sidewalk that could take that kind of access and still be a beautiful sidewalk. So how do you lift the stones? How do you get underneath it? We also got a moratorium from the utilities for five years. They weren't allowed to dig anything. I mean, so watch every five years from now. It's just going to be like oh, this is it's this beam which is about to disappear. <laughs> any, North, any North American who travels and come back and tell you it's just fantastic the infrastructure in Europe. It's so much better than ours. You know, we just took the channel from. Paris to London, what's the matter with us? And the answer is a lot of things. But see, I, I think what, happened, what happened in Toronto is very simple. Peter pointed out the government, the Ontario government passed this law, and those same suburban developers who got to be unbelievably rich 
because they didn't know how to spell Europe. Uh, they didn't know what a crisis is. They suddenly discovered downtown Toronto. They discovered condos. It wasn't the planners, it wasn't the government, it wasn't the civil service. It was really old-fashioned free enterprise. And naturally, there's a hell of a problem because they don't give a damn about infrastructure. They're interested in making big money. They're not interested in society one iota. An incredible pioneer in terms of changing the whole mission, which you referred to earlier about encouraging people to stay and live and intensify downtown. Um, I've lost my train of thought. I was on a good train. <laughs> well, he said to me, uh, he started spelling it. Thank you. First of all, I came from London yesterday, and then I was at the OMB all day, being tried to be tripped up by a fancy lawyer, so my brain is a little bit. Anyway, he said to me, you know, when he started as a developer in 1997, after the big financial depression of Southern Ontario, he said, Peter, you know, I think there's a real market for Walker. And I just looked at it and I said, oh, come on, Al, really. Someone's going to make a locational decision to live based upon where they work. That's ridiculous. The whole idea of the Metro Central Area Plan in the early 60s was terror with these kind of commercial nodes. Spoken hub. Spoken hub and all that kind of stuff. And yet that is what's happening. That is the luxury market. Well, it's also the entry level. Yeah, it's actually just the normal. I think every single that's worth an office that's located downtown would down rise up like quite quite consciously. And they live in condominium. And the greatest thing we could do, the simplest thing, the cheapest thing we could do. And I'm you know, I on the war with like Nazis at various council meetings and stuff, particularly on Bloor Street, but we can, and we are starting to do that. A coherent, safe system of uh, bike lanes that are separated from traffic and people, because they're just as crazy as the drivers. So. <laughs> um, through public private partnerships, quite simply. Talked about, talked about, David, about how you need to invest in infrastructure to get the private sector to, to invest in your real estate development uh, projects. I, I think there are two current initiatives that our office is involved in that suggest that this will be more of the future. Um, Reach Park, which is, I think, an extraordinary initiative, financing and leveraging private sector development to, in part, aid in the renewal of, of affordable and social housing in various forms. Second is the Pan Am Games of West Long Lines, where there is a major component of affordable housing, two different affordable uh, partners going into that project as part of the, uh, that neighborhood. And so I think what those two show is that you need an engagement between private sector and the public sector to really do this, because the private sector is not going to do it on their own, for very obvious reasons. Um, and so I, I think we'll start to see more of that. There's uh, Alexander Park that Adam Vaughn's involved with, and there, there are early initiatives there to do a similar thing, albeit different through the uh, Park. And uh, so I think it's going to get better, but I think people like you, Stig, need to keep reminding through public discourse that this is an important thing. Any civilized city in the world engages in the messy and expensive business of providing housing. I think the, the geography of the city will change. Uh, and as Toronto becomes a more global city, there may inevitably be an area of central downtown which is very expensive and very cosmopolitan as I try to indicate in this picture of Scarborough, there are so many places um, almost directly adjacent to the downtown Toronto that, that, that can be transformed and can be rebuilt uh, and, and sustain a much better social and uh, uh, social life than they currently can. Um, so uh, it's inevitable that, that we will have gentrification, but that doesn't mean that, we, that the city shouldn't be planning for, um, for other kinds. Well, the 
great leverage is uh, public land on land. So yes. you take, for example, the Port Lands, which is, I don't know, there's 200 acres out there. Eventually it's going to get developed. That's the big kind of land reserve for Toronto. It's there's a, no lack of land. No, it's as large as the central area of Toronto. And uh, in set, in design of the new somewhat conversant with how that's going to roll out, at least one of the stakeholders. But there will be significant portions of affordable housing as part of that um, legacy of development of that, of that part of the city. Okay. Thank all of you. See you at, uh, at Mobility Adventure Life in the spring.